I want to win in 2024. I will literally, I will, I will, I don't know. I will riot. I don't know. I want to win badly in 2024. Uh, to the point where people who are being stupid and cre- like the leadership of the RNC uh, and create a very frustrating obstacle, you know, I feel like that's uh, that's exactly what it is. It's an obstacle. I have issues with that. Uh, and I think we really that's something we got to deep dive on coming up at some point. But I want to win in 2024. And I am very, very concerned because I feel like a lot of people are being baited and played. They're being baited and played hardcore. Now, this new poll that came out, I was looking at it. Let me, let me just tell you. So Iowa, if you don't understand, let me lay it, lay it down. You have early states that have their primaries and caucuses, right? And those states ultimately determine after a candidate goes through that rush, right? After they rush those early states. After that, then you kind of have, you know, at least a front runner for the nomination for candidacy. And that's why I always say it's a delegate race in the very beginning. And that's all they're focused on. And Iowa is the first state. Now, people who win the Iowa uh, caucus don't always necessarily go on to win the presidency. I mean, for crying out loud, Ted Cruz has won the Iowa caucus before. I mean, there's a long there's a there's a a lot of examples of people winning the caucus, but yet not not winning the presidency. This election is a little different. And I think because everything I think it's it's there's a lot of dynamics that have changed. One thing that hasn't changed is the sucky state of polling. One thing that you have to realize, excuse me, and this is perhaps one of the most important things to, to recognize in politics right now is that polling is an industry. Much like you have lobbying as an industry, polling is in itself very similar. It is its own industry. Uh, there are too few very scientifically based polling firms. And then when you even look at aggregates, a lot of the aggregation will exclude like state polls or this type of poll or that poll. And they all have their own certain rules for inclusion. Everyone is competing to be kind of like the standard, right? The gold standard. Everybody competes. But there isn't really a firm that is the gold standard. That's why one of, they're so completely unreliable. You can have candidates that hire firms to do surveys, and then they will use that as a way to set narratives. And the media loves to cite, well, this survey says, well, this survey says, they like to cite it like it's just absolutely unquestionable scientific data. And that's not the case. The polls were wrong. I mean, the polls were wrong in 2016. That's where you got the whole silent majority that came out of that. The polls were wrong in 2016, guys. The polls were wrong in 2018, guys. The polls were wrong in 2020, guys. The polls were wrong in 2022, guys. At what point, when the hell did we start believing in polls? When? There were a few polls that were correct going into 2020 that didn't show a red wave. And they were smaller, they were from less known firms, and they didn't get a lot of attention. And they had small sample sizes, and I get it, it's a little tough to do that. You also have to, there there was this big narrative of red wave in 2020 that did not manifest. And then you also had this problem of split ticket voting that was developing beginning in 2018, and then really exploded in 2020 that Republicans don't know how to deal with, they don't talk to their voters about, and because Republicans, the Republican Party doesn't know how to deal with it, and they don't talk to their voters about it, they encourage the voters to accept that the presence of split-ticket voting and the inability to explain the results of that somehow means the existence of absolute, undeniable fraud to the point where it can change the outcome of an election. Now, there's, it is a real thing, and it's something that the RNC is garbage at dealing with and they've had since 2018 to deal with us now split ticket voting is when like in texas we this just changed in texas like we used to have uh one ticket but no we don't have that anymore uh that was a court battle and and in texas that's changed i noted that back in 2020 and this is a kind of a result of that you don't have any straight ticket voting in texas anymore and after you got after you eliminated straight ticket voting in Texas in 2020, you ended up having John Cornyn, senator, 
who got more votes than Donald Trump in Texas. And Texas is considered a red state, correct? I live in the most conservative district in the state. And I was looking at actual hard data. I had was getting uh, numbers from the Secretary of State's website. I was talking to independent pollsters, uh, people who were working elections, all this stuff. And a lot of people say, well, it's fraud, it's fraud, it's fraud. Now, there is fraud. Don't get me wrong. The question has always been, is it enough to change the outcome of a very decentralized election designed specifically to prevent that kind of outcome? And in Texas, the result of John Cornyn, who is a very moderate Republican, getting more votes than Donald Trump is a, revol- is a result of split-ticket voting, not fraud. That's only part of the reason. The second part is voter turnout. Republicans are their own worst enemies when it comes to voting. There are more Republicans than there are Democrats in a number of different states. Like in Georgia, the reason we lost that special election in the Senate is because Republicans didn't show up. Now, I know the unpopular thing that politicians are told, never do this, never blame the voters, never talk about the voters. The voters are to be, we're all to be treated like precious little babies, right? We're all, we're not precious. And you have to take accountability for the future of your own country. I literally know people, I have family in Georgia that didn't vote. I found that out quite by accident. I was like, what? You're, you're a registered Republican. There were a lot of Republicans that didn't vote, like a million of them. There were a lot. Republicans are their own worst enemy when it comes to voting. The turnout, if, if even 75% of the Republicans turned out to vote every election, the turnout would be such that it would overwhelm any kind of decentralized shenanigans. But we're not seeing that. That's not the case. Now, in Texas, like I said, you had split ticket voting. You had people who voted Republican down ticket, but at the top, they either didn't vote, they voted for somebody else, or they did a write-in. That's what happened in Texas with Trump, is that split ticket voting. The Republican Party, again, this is, we saw this coming up in 2018 in a number of different states, and the Republican Party had no answer for it. They still have no answer for it. How do you deal with that? And then secondly, it causes people to have a conversation that they do not want to have. Why did people vote that way? Now, if you even engage in this conversation, political operatives have trained you to think that that is a betrayal. And there are political operatives on the right. And the reason I'm calling it out is because I view them as an obstruction to victory in 2024. When you as a party cannot sit down without emotions like the left, and have an honest conversation about why you're trailing here or why split-ticket voting is suddenly a major issue for your party or why we're having these issues. How can we strengthen our soft spots? How can we harden those? And how can we, have a, how can we clear a path to victory when your party is too afraid to have that conversation because they don't want to tick off other people in the party? That is a problem. That is a bigger threat to victory in 2024 than Democrats. The Republican Party is scared of its own damn shadow, and that is more powerful than anything that the Democrats could do. You have the RNC leader who doesn't want to do anything because the RNC leader got their job because of a politician. So you can't, they can't be honest about it. I want to win in 24, and I don't give a hot damn with whom. I have my preference in the primary. I will not apologize for being an American and living in a country where we have a republic-style election system that uses a democratic process and we enjoy freedoms that people have fought and died for. I will never apologize for that. We don't live in a monarchy. We have a republic. But I want to win in 24. But I also want to do everything I can in the meantime to make sure that it is an absolutely rock-solid ticket in 2024. And this is where we're getting into the polling. In 2022, the red wave never materialized. Virginia, remember how I said a few weeks ago the election of Virginia was a bellwether? 
everyone thought that Republicans were going to take the delegate House of Delegates and they were going to take the Senate. And you had Youngkin as a governor. And I'd said that, well, Republicans really, if you look at the polling, they had actually overperformed in the previous election due to COVID and uh, a lot of the stuff in the schools, because that was a, one of the ground zero places. And that the way that the election happened recently is a little bit more in tune with the voter makeup there. And then also you had redistricting, which really didn't go in a Republican's favor. But I said Virginia was a bellwether. You had a couple of other elections where it was thought that Republicans were going to perform well and they underperformed. People, the Republican Party is leading you wrong. And they're afraid to say anything because they don't want to make candidates mad. They don't want to make the former president mad. They don't want to make Republican operatives mad because it's been a, it's become a popularity contest instead of a party of leadership. You have more people who, you, I, I mean, I'm. I don't dislike Ronna Romney McDaniel. I don't. I've met her in person, but this is about the business of the country. So my saying is that this is show business, not show friends. And the business of the country is telling me right now that RNC leadership is failing. And no one is willing to stand up and say, okay, knock this stuff off. Can I do a case in point? You're going to get mad at me, but I got to say it. I saw a uh, tweet. It was something that the president had put out. And he had said that, I, th I thought it was kind of interesting because he was kind of going after, I guess, Cruz and Hawley, Josh Hawley in Missouri, saying that, oh, their primaries could get very, very interesting. It's what he had posted on his platform. And then there's an account on Twitter or X that reposts that stuff that Trump posts on his platform. Basically, it's Trump saber rattling. He's mad that he doesn't have an endorsement from Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley yet. I don't think that you can threaten a Republican candidate in a primary in a state that you lost the most conservative district by 2,000 votes. Ted Cruz lost the district I live in, lost the county I live in by 2,000 votes to Beto O'Rourke. It was the most, it's the most conservative county in the state, and Ted Cruz lost it. The problem is bigger than that. And I don't think that Trump can threaten primaries against Senate candidates or senators for not endorsing him if he couldn't even carry the state against John Cornyn. I'm saying that to say in 2024, I want to win and I don't want candidates making mistakes for themselves. I don't want them making I don't want them making problems for themselves that they're going to have difficulty in getting over later. I don't give a hot damn about someone's ego. I don't care about kissing their butt. I want to win in 2024 because I firmly believe that this is it. I'm not saying that for radio. I'm not saying that for clicks. That This is it, guys. You will never be able to claw back. The country will be irrevocably changed. Freedom once lost is lost forever.